Hi, I'm Josh Fay, executive pastor here at Black Rock Church, and as many of you now know me, Farmer Josh. For the past month, we've been talking about things that help us grow spiritually and seeing if they can help the grass grow too. Things like worship, serving, and community. Today, we're gonna to talk about the last and possibly the most important growth step, and that is ownership. What's ownership, you might ask? Well, ownership is just taking ownership of actually growing yourself spiritually. It means you seek out and then do the things that help you grow. And what's ownership mean to me? Well, it means I gotta cut my own grass. Good morning, my name is Pastor Larry and I'm one of the pastors here also. I'm the missions pastor. I came here in 1997. For most of those 20 years that I've been here, I was also the executive pastor. And I've noticed something peculiar in the last few months since Josh took over as the executive pastor and I've just assumed the responsibility of being the global missions pastor. And that simply put is this, He's been given the opportunity to be Farmer Josh. And I think there was a case here for age discrimination. And in 20 years, I've never been asked to wear a hat like this. But I'm here to declare for all of you who are AARP card-carrying members, my name is Pastor Larry, and I'm a farmer. Seriously, it's been great to be part of the pastoral staff here. In the past three weeks, we've had a series called Grow. We opened it with Rob Genta talking about the importance of worship. It's not a question whether we worship or not. It's just a question, what do we worship? Our society would have us worship money, sex, power, integrity, whatever it might be. But as Christ followers, we understand that we need to come together once a week and to worship our God and Creator and give praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Rob talked about that. And then the second week, Pastor Steve talked about serving, how important it is for us in a society that seeks to isolate us, for us to be involved in serving. We had 148 people sign up as part of our fair that we had in the... Uh, Welcome Center, the ministry fair, to be involved in some type of ministry here at the church. Then last week, Pastor Steve talked about community. And again, in a society that seeks to isolate us, he talked about the importance of getting together in community and being involved in each other and being involved in the community group. Today, we're going to look at ownership. When you think of ownership, it, it kind of seems to be out of sync with the other three. When I was in college, I took a Bible class called the Minor Prophets. And I well remember the first day of the class, the professor went up and talked a little bit about the syllabus and what we were responsible for. And one of the students came forth and said, you know, I need to drop this class. And the professor was perplexed and said, why are you dropping the class? And the student said, well, you see, I'm a business major and I thought Minor Prophets dealt with small business administration <laughs> and that you make minor profits. Well, sometimes when we look at ownership, it seems like it's a narcissistic concept. I mean, one of the first things a two-year-old learns, what's the first word he or she will learn is often the word mine. It's mine. It's my toy. It's my place. It's my house. It's my mummy. So as we look at ownership this morning, let's see if I can make a case for this. It's important. Josh talked about that in the video. I invite you to open your Bible to Joshua, the fourth chapter. We're going to look at God's word in the Old Testament. The sixth book of the Bible, Joshua 4. Let me set it in context. 
Israel has come out of Egypt. They've been led by a mighty man, a man we all know as Moses. Moses, however, is about to die, and all the people who have come out of Egypt are about to die because of their disobedience. They're going to die in wandering in the wilderness. But Moses comes to Joshua, and he gives him this charge, as you see up there on the screen behind me. It says, Joshua 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 6, Be strong and courageous, because you are to lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Those in Moses' generation are not going to make it. They're going to die. It's up to the next generation to enter into the promised land. Oh, and this generation now comes to their own body of water. But it's not the Red Sea. It's a river. It's the Jordan River. And it's the season of the flood. And as they stand before their body of water, they wonder, will the God who parted the Red Sea do anything with this body of water? Picture the scene. All of Israel is drawn up before the Jordan River. And they wonder, is God going to again act? Is he going to overrule nature itself? And then an odd thing happens. The priests pick up the Ark of the Covenant, the symbol of God's presence, and they make their way to the river. And they put their foot in the river, and slowly the river, or maybe it's quickly, we're not told, the water start to part, part. And Joshua, the third chapter, verse 16, says that the water cascades all the way up and stops 16 miles in a place called Adam, Adam. And the people of Israel, seeing what's just happened, they start to cross the river. They lead their cattle, their children, everything they possess. But God has spoken to Joshua. And he says in our text now, verse 2, Choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell, tell them to take the 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priest stood, and to carry them over with you, and put them down at the place where they stay tonight. So Joshua called together 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God in the middle of the river. Each of you is to take up a stone in his shoulder. As all of Israel watches, now on the east side of the river, these 12 men go back into the river and they pry up 12 stones and they carry them with them. What are the 12 stones symbolic of? The people have not heard thunder from a mountain. Only Joshua has heard the word of the Lord. But three purposes are given. First, verse 5. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of his tribe of Israel to serve as a sign to you. Gilgal, where these stones are going to be piled up, is going to be the place where Israel assembles. And they're going to conquer First, the city of Jericho, and it's going to be easy. The walls are going to come tumbling down, but then they're going to, be going to get to a place called Ai, and the fortress will not seed itself, and things are difficult. And so during the good times and during the bad times, they are to remember back, is to be assigned to them. I've had the sciatica problem for like three weeks now, and I've been only getting two hours of sleep, and it's so easy when you're going through a difficult time, to forget the goodness of God. To forget that God cares for us during the good and the bad times. Stones of remembrance, sign that God has, has been with us. But there is a second 
purpose of the stones. The last half of verse 6. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Verse 7, tell them that the flow of the river was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. When your children ask, what do those stones mean? The people who have witnessed it are to tell those who have not what God has done on their behalf. Over the years, the generation will come and go. The Hebrew society will continue. Israel actually means people beyond the river. And so these people beyond the river are to remember, and especially for their children, what had happened. Why is it so easy? Or why is it so necessary to remember? Because it's so easy to forget. Isn't it so easy to forget God's goodness when we're going through a difficulty now? And there is a third reason. The third reason is found in verse 24. He did this so that all peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful. And so you might always fear the Lord your God. Francis Schaeffer, commenting on this verse, said this, the stones were to tell the other nations around them that this God is different. He really exists. He's a living God, a God of real power who is imminent in the world. Our God, even in the Old Testament, is a global God. We're going to understand this more and more as we drop into the New Testament. But even back here, as they are crossing the river, Joshua says, so that all people of the earth might know. These stones of remembrance are like bookmarks, like post-it arcs, in the chronology of your life. Let me give you a couple of my stones of remembrance. The 10 years of ministry at my other church I served at prior to coming to here at Black Rock, Susan and I determined that we we're going to go overseas to be missionaries for 10 months in a sabbatical. Truth be told, my wife, who grew up in Afghanistan, really wanted me to be a missionary. Up to this point, even though I'd been in a church that had a strong missions program, I had had no contact with missions at all. And so when we landed in Manila, a place where the people are just wonderful, but it's hot, and I didn't know the culture, and I didn't know the language, and I didn't adapt very well at all. As a matter of fact, I started a countdown calendar. As if I was in Vietnam, you know, 129 days, next day, 128, 127. Lord, get me out of here. I remember literally going to the airport and watching the airplanes taking off and think, I've got to get on one of those. I mean, my wife used the word, I didn't even know what it meant. She said I was insufferable. I had to go look it up. What does that word mean? But I didn't adapt to well at all because I was going through something called culture shock. And I had no idea what it was. And out of that is a stone of remembrance. Because that is the moment, that is the time when God called me not to be a missionary, but to be a missions pastor. And for the next 30 years, I devoted my life to the undertaking of sending missionaries throughout the world. You know, in some ways I joke and say, I'm not tough enough to be a missionary. But God has called me to help send missionaries. And as a church, we've raised millions and millions of dollars to send missionaries overseas. And that time in Manila is a stone of remembrance. Ten years later, we took another trip, this time to Ecuador. And we thought that would be an easier way. I was going to be down there. I was going to be working at HCJB, one of the ministries we support. I was going to be teaching at a Alliance Academy, a Christian school. I was going to be pastoring the English Fellowship Church in, in Quito. But it was during that sabbatical that I came to understand spiritual warfare. And I felt what I call the breath of the evil one on my shoulders as he attacked our family. 
And that's a stone of remembrance because it helps me understand what it can be like for a missionary when they're overseas and Satan is doing everything he can to discourage them. Stones of remembrance. Why are they important? Because they mark spiritual growth in our lives. We here at the church are very serious about providing you opportunities to take ownership of your own spiritual life. And the one thing about Stones of Remembrance is that you can't build Stone of Remembrance with other people's stones. It has to be your experience. It has to be your rocks. It has to be your pile, your memories of God's goodness. And even during the tar- hard times, to be able to look back and say, I can remember in the midst of everything going on around me that seems to be in a point of upheaval that God is good. The stones of remembrance remind me of that. And so this chart behind me is right off our web page. So maybe you need to be involved in one of the Sunday school classes that we have here. We call them growth classes. Kairos or Faith and Fellowship or one of the other ones that meets Sunday morning. Or maybe you want to go on a stamp trip. I almost want to make a promise to you. And that promise is this. If you go on a stamp trip, a short-term mission trip, and you go overseas and God doesn't change your life, we'll give you your money back. In my other church, we had the same ministry for 20 years, and we sent hundreds of people overseas and never gave a penny back. In this church, in the first 10 years I was here, we sent five over 500 people overseas and never gave a penny back. Now, not all of them were missionaries. We couldn't afford it if all of them were missionaries. But God used that trip as they were with the missionary in the context of their ministry to change their lives. We sent a group of our high school students to Israel. That will change their lives. That will be a stone of remembrance. So maybe for you, it's going on a stamp trip. Or maybe it's joining one of the men and women's Bible studies or going on the men and women's retreat. And men, the retreat is coming up in September. Many people will say one of their stones of remembrance is our Financial Peace University, when for the first time they came to understand their responsibility and the privilege they have as they set their budget and as they they use their money in a correct way for the betterment of the kingdom of God, but also for their betterment. Many of us would say one of our stones of remembrance is our baptism, when we public displayed our commitment to Christ. But the principle remains. You and I, we are responsible. It's our ownership that results in our commitment to worship, our commitment to serve, our commitment to a community group. You can't build stones of remembrance with somebody else's stones. How did Urban Impact start in this church? And then a ministry we have for the inner city kids and their families, the projects in Bridgeport. Three guys, two businessmen and a pastor, went on a short-term missions trip to New Orleans after the Hurricane Katrina, Bob Niedermeyer, Rick Fawcett, Pastor Jeremy. And they went to New Orleans thinking they were just going to help the people there. But the people down there said, why are you down here? Don't you have needs in the community around you? And they started to think and pray about what's going on in Bridgeport. And so they came back and they started this ministry called Urban Impact in 2008. Since then, we've ministered to over 600 kids with over 250 volunteers. And just this past month, we look back over the past 12 months, we determined that there are 306 kids that we've ministered to 
with over 7,000 hours of tutoring and individual contact. Or I think of Carol Dannenberg, who in 2000, uh, excuse me, 1996, had a desire to do something for the foster kids in our community. And so, so she went to her family and said, you know, for my birthday, I don't want any gifts. I'm asking that you just give me money so I can go get the training for this ministry called Royal Family Kids Camp. And so she went and got the training and came back. For the last 20 years, we've had this camp for foster kids where we've taken them away for a week to a camp. Many of them have, out of the inner city, they've never been away to a camp like this. And the counselors not only have to pay their own way, give their own time, they have to also raise the money so that the kids don't have to pay a penny. And this all started because she took ownership or something. Now, right now, you're probably thinking, I, I just can't do that. But I bet if you were to ask Jeremy and Rick, and Rob and Carol, when they first had the inkling to do something, if they had any idea that a ministry like this would continue year upon year and touch hundreds and hundreds of kids, that's why inner ownership is so important. Because it says, I am responsible. Only I am responsible. My spouse is not responsible for my spiritual growth. Parents can help with a young person's spiritual growth, but ultimately, a high school kid is responsible for their spiritual growth. No one else can do it for you. You have to do it. Stones of remembrance. What are those stones of remembrance in your life? Those times when you can sense God's goodness and God's work. Those times when you can talk to your children and your loved ones about this stone of remembrance. And the final sign of that God is at work in the world. I have an assignment for you. Simply put, it's this. This day as you gather with your family, maybe for a dinner, or maybe you're going to be go to the beach, or out on your boat, or whatever it might be, that you'll take the opportunity to share with those around you what are those stones of remembrance? What are those things that you look back on and say, that's where God worked in my life in a very special way. And share them with your children and with your friends and neighbors. And remember them, even when you go through difficulties today. Would you stand with me for closing? We want to thank you for watching and listening to our sermons online. And we hope that uh, you will be inspired to live more like Jesus through these. Please check out blackrock.org for more information about our church. Know that you can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. And also uh, know that you can give uh, to BlackRock and to our ministry through PushPay, through our mobile app, and on our website. Your uh, donations and your support of our ministry allows us to have uh, these videos online and for us to impact our community.